Hello again. Let's see. I first saw God a couple years ago. I stood with my parents and a few strangers in a small dark room and we heard this. The man we heard was so earnest and saying with such emotion that some of us started to laugh uncomfortably and the rest of us were moved to tears. And I knew that this was an experience that was going to follow me for some time. God is a video installation by a contemporary Icelandic artist named Ragnar Kjartansson. The installation is based on a live performance piece titled Sorrow Conquers Happiness, which Kjartansson debuted in Iceland in 2004 and has performed throughout Europe in the 12 years since. In both the live performance and video installation, Kjartansson repeatedly sings this phrase, Sorrow Conquers Happiness, to a half hour long, subtly morphing melody composed by his friend David Thor Jonsson. When Kjartansson completes his rendition of the song, he repeats it again and again for seven hours straight. Kjartansson is one of Iceland's most successful artists. His installations have been exhibited at Palais de Tokyo, the New Museum, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Venice Biennale. <coughs> One of his works was recently acquired by SF MoMA. He is often chosen to represent the Icelandic art scene at festivals, and he's ideally suited to illustrate it. Ask an arts professional who has knowledge of the contemporary Icelandic art scene to characterize it, and you'll hear a persistent refrain. Art made in Iceland is unorthodox, unpredictable, unrestrained. Kjartansson's gallerist, Börkur Arnarsson, claims that contemporary Icelandic artists are unfettered by tradition, discipline, and context. Elsewhere in the world, artists continue to extend or react against established local conventions, but Arnarsson says that in Iceland, there's a freedom to try whatever you want and to get away with it. In 2004, an Icelandic artist named Gabriela Friedrichsdóttir collaborated with Kjartansson on the performance we see here. In Ode to Bippi Mortens, the two artists clad themselves in nylon stockings and bread slippers and sang a song in honor of one of Iceland's most prolific folk musicians. Friedrichsdóttir credits her own artistic ingenuity to the freedom Icelandic people have because of the lack of tradition. In Iceland, she says, there's an enormous space of nothingness where local convention and cultural customs would usually reign. In 2013, Ragnar Kjartansson and the 12 other Icelandic artists pictured here acted out a scene from Roman mythology at MoMA PS1. Using a foam machine, vacuum cleaner, garbage can, and inflatable whale, these artists created a musical performance that told the story of Venus's birth from sea foam. <laughs> German art historian Dr. Christian Schön asserts that, that this whole generation of Icelandic artists displays a refreshingly disrespectful approach to art history. He says that if anything typifies art made in Iceland, it is its devotion to universally popular trends. I would argue that in its unboundedness, the work of Icelandic artists is prototypically post-national. Jürgen Habermas defines post-nationalism as the end result of a historically momentous dynamic, which follows an abstraction from local to national to democratic consciousness and could culminate in a globalized society that transcends the affective ties of nation, language, place, and heritage. 
According to Habermas, a post-national society may be expected to take into account the autonomy, particularity, and uniqueness of formerly sovereign states and create a new multiplicity of interconnected cultures. The post-national is the rich and productive interpermeation of local and global forces. But the current discourse surrounding Kjartansson's art and Icelandic visual culture in general leads us to believe that it has severed its ties to a heritage, that it is utterly unbeholden to any local or national expectations, and that there is no such thing as Icelandic art. When Arnarsson, Friedrichsdöttir, and Schön claim that art made in Iceland is unencumbered by local tradition, they suggest that its significance and global relevance depends on the emergent insignificance and irrelevance of its national borders and history. They assert that art made in contemporary Iceland bubbles up out of a cultural vacuum or an enormous space of nothingness. And in doing so, they locate it at the extreme end of a spectrum, safely out of the reach of nationalism, but also far beyond post-nationalism, at a point where local and national in influences are not just de-romanticized, but totally devalued and perhaps even non-existent. This discourse threatens to homogenize Iceland's best-known art into a kind of global monoculture, erasing its singularity rather than acknowledging its place in a Habermasian constellation of hybridized cultures. Such declarations can be dangerous, for when we interpret art within an exclusively global rather than post-national framework, some of its poetic nuances are lost. We close ourselves off to certain interpretations of art that are affecting and constructive. Let's return to God. Most of Kjartansson's artworks, including God, center on a discrete phrase or gesture, an episode. This episode usually cites the work of another artist, like Kjartansson's friend Jonsson, and feels well-worn. The words, sorrow conquers happiness, call to mind stereotypically depressed Scandinavians, like the Norwegian painter Edvard Munch or the melancholy Dane Hamlet. And the episode is rendered in one of several conventional pop cultural styles. In God, Kjartansson's sleek getup, big band, and glamorous backdrop emulate those of rat pack crooners like Bing Crosby, Frank Sinatra, and Dean Martin. All of Kjartansson's performances last hours, days, months, or even years. Each performance of Sorrow Conquers Happiness is just a fragment of a long, evolving project that extends over a decade and across oceans. When Kjartansson performed in a restaurant in Reykjavik, Iceland in 2004, he sang in English and a local jazz trio accompanied him. But when he sang in an elegant train station in St. Petersburg, Russia in 2014, his performance took on a different tone. He sang in Russian, supported by a chamber orchestra and police choir. Because critics and curators operate on the premise that Icelandic art has no local precedent, they often associate specific elements of Kjartansson's strategy with primary features of international postmodernism. They, they associate his use of appropriation with pastiche and his work's episodic looping with the schizophrenic conception of time. According to curator Cecilia Alemani, for example, when Kjartansson dons the guise of a rat pack crooner, his mimicry is detached and empty. It preserves none of the connotations that originally saturated the rat pack style and generates none of its own. She compares God to a cabaret performance by a vaudevillian idiot savant. Understood within a postmodern framework, Kjartansson's work is neutral parody, in which elements of the past are replicated without nostalgia and without any particular concern for their import. But what would happen if we allowed ourselves to associate Kjartansson's strategy with elements of Icelandic culture? Iceland celebrates a long storytelling tradition. For almost a millennium, Icelanders passed down stories orally, often in the form of melodic alliterative poetry. 
Even today, Icelanders perform traditional poems and informally compose alliterative verse to commemorate notable events. Like Kjartansson's performances, traditional Icelandic poems are episodic, appropriative, and structured through repetition. Musicologist Hreit Stengrimsson has described how pre-modern Icelandic performers composed stanzas that they either repeated again and again or combined with other modular episodes to comprise a musical performance that lasted hours, days, weeks, or even months. According to Stengrimsson, these pre-modern performers regularly cited the work of their peers and predecessors to conserve and celebrate valuable cultural lore. They also often translated foreign stories, committed them to alliterative verse, and infused them with references to local mythology so that the context would be accessible to their countrymen. Once foreign texts like the Protestant Catechism or 1001 Nights had been tailored to local audiences, they became common knowledge and part of the local canon. If we assume that Kjartansson is repurposing this Icelandic tradition for an international fine arts community, we see that his art may be understood to celebrate and preserve its influences rather than empty them of their original meaning. His work interlaces his friend's melody with Scandinavian sadness, with the style of American crooners, with his own intonations, and does so in such a way that it can be adapted to the vernacular of each audience who sees him perform, no matter where they are in the world, no matter whether they are in a Reykjavik restaurant, a Russian train station, or perhaps a gallery in New York or in San Francisco. Kjartansson's work likely draws on both global postmodernism and pre-modern Icelandic traditions. The problem with relegating Kjartansson's work exclusively to a form of international postmodernism is that the significance of the work in acknowledging, penetrating, and transcending the affective ties of nation, language, place, and heritage may be overlooked. His work moves us all to tears or laughter. When we acknowledge contemporary art's rootedness in a national cultural heritage, we come closer to achieving a Habermasian post-nationalist ideal than when we deny and devalue those roots. Thank you.